video, we're going to look at a, f a favorite short story of mine, Edward P. Jones's The First Day. So if you go to week two, and here's Edward P. Jones's The First Day. Uh, all right, here we go. And I think we could, how do we flip this thing around right here? All right, flip this thing around. So this is this is Edward P. Jones is a, a really one of my favorite writers, African American writer. This is from a collection called Lost in the City that was published in 1992. Won some big awards. Uh, it's a it's an amazing book of short stories. He, he's kind of basing it off of and riffing off of James Joyce's Dubliners. So in Edward P. Jones is Lost in the City, all the stories take place in and around the environs of Washington D.C. But it's not the the you know the fancy political areas. It's these back back uh, streets and it's the poorer parts. And the collection of short stories it follows chronologically the main characters from youngest to oldest. This is the second story in the collection. Another fascinating thing about this collection is that there are no white people in the book. It's all about African Americans. And I think what it does wonderfully and beautifully is, you know, sometimes it's easy to show kind of the racist stuff between whites and blacks, how whites are racist towards blacks, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I'm fascinated with the interplay and small notes of class and how people within a similar race kind of look down and look upon one another. So let's look at the first day. Uh, this story is narrated it's about a young girl's first day of school but if you notice though she is older looking back upon this day and about her mother so let's let's read this on an otherwise unremarkable september morning long before i learned to be ashamed of my mother she takes my hand and we set off down new jersey avenue to begin my very first day of school I'm wearing a checkered like blue and green cotton dress, and scattered about these colors are bits of yellow and white and brown. My mother has uncharacteristically spent nearly an hour on my hair that morning, plating and replating, so that now my scalp tingles. Whenever I turn my head quickly, my nose fills with the faint smell of Dixie peach hair grease. The smell is somehow a soothing one now, and I will reach for it time and time again before the morning ends. All the plates, each with a blue barrette near the tip and each twisted into an uncommon sturdiness, will last until I go to bed that night, something that has never happened before. My stomach is full of milk and oatmeal sweetened with brown sugar. Like everything else I have on, my pale green slip and underwear are new, the underwear having come three to a plastic package with a little girl on the front who appears to be dancing. Behind my ears, my mother, to stop my whining, has dabbed the stingiest bit of her gardenia perfume, the last present my father gave her before he disappeared into memory. Because I cannot smell it, I have only her word that the perfume is there. I am also wearing yellow socks trimmed with thin lines of black and white around the tops. My shoes are my greatest joy, black patent leather miracles, and when one is nicked at the toe later that morning in class, my heart will break. This is, you know, if any of you are write fiction poet, this is writing 101 right here. This is almost a short story in and of itself. This first paragraph, uh, the first day of school. Think back to your first day of school. How old are we? We're like five or six, right? Long before I learned to be ashamed of my mother. You know, think when we're young. And I'm wondering, I'm asking you all, at what age do we become? And, and we're going to look at the difference between like embarrassment and shame. When we're little, you know, a lot of times we we worship our parents. They're they're our heroes. Like they can do no wrong, and then we get to a certain age where we see the cracks in their armor. Right? We see they're not perfect. We notice their uh, little foibles, their problems, their things that 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 we notice. Like, huh? They're not perfect people. But right here, very these details. What the little girl's wearing checkered like blue and green cotton dress you know it's a big day it's an important day it's the first day of school the mother has spent an hour plating and replaying the hair you know it's she's getting her all ready 
the Dixie peach hair grease, all these little details. She's full, you know, she's well fed. Everything's new clothes. Why are these details so important? Why is this first day so important? The mother, this is education is really important to the mother. And this is a big deal. It's the little girl's first day in school. And what happened to the father? We know the mother is a single mother. The father, one or two things could have happened. Right here. The, the gardenia perfume. The last present my father gave here before he disappeared in a memory. He either died or he left. Right? Uh, and there's a lot to be said about class here. My shoes are my greatest joy. Black patent leather miracles. And when one is nicked at the toe later that morning in class, my heart will break. Th these are her only pair of, of the good shoes, right? So when they're, when they're nicked, it's, she's like, damn, my shoes. You know, her one nice pair of shoes. She doesn't have a closet full of nice clothes. This is when you go to school the first day and you're wearing all your good stuff. This is it. This is a big deal. So this is important both to the mother and because it's important to the mother, the little girl knows it's important. This is a, we'll return to this po point though, because the way the language is here, the little girl who's older now looking back, she has a brilliant way of using language and that's going to illustrate something. She calls her shoes black patent leather miracles. All right, let's continue. I am carrying a pencil, a pencil sharpener, and a small 10 cent tablet with a black and white speckled cover. My mother does not believe that a girl in kindergarten needs such things, so I am taking them only because of my insistent whining and because they are a presence from our neighbors, Mary Keith and Blondell Harris. Miss Mary and Miss Blondell are watching my two younger sisters until my mother returns. The women are as precious to me as my mother and sisters. Out playing one day, I have overheard an older child speaking to another child Call Miss Mary and Miss Blondell a word that is brand new to me. This is my mother. When I say the word in fun to one of my sisters, my mother slaps me across the mouth and the word is lost for years and years. What is that word? What do you think the little girl overhears someone calling Miss Mary and Miss Blondell? Think of it, right? We have these two older women living together. It's probably a horrible epithet for a same-sex couple and you know uh, we're gonna we're gonna get to the time period here i'm thinking this is around the 50s right and there's a couple context clues would the other little girl call them call one perhaps dyke you know just a really horrible word name and the little girl doesn't know what it is so she repeats it and the mother slaps her <laughs> this is an important moment because the mother you know this little girl she has manners she knows how to act she, you know, the mother can't teach her much, but she's teaching her manners. But this also illustrates uh, Miss Mary and Miss Blondell. The women are as precious to me as my mother and sisters. They're important. And we notice here as well, uh, there's two younger sisters. So there's three kids and the, and the mom probably works. Mary, Keith and Blondell, one or the both watch the kids during the day. <laughs> All the way down New Jersey Avenue, the sidewalks are teeming with children. In my neighborhood, I have many friends, but I see none of them as my mother and I walk. We cross New York Avenue. We cross Pierce Street. We cross Ellen K. And still I see no one who knows my name. At I Street, between New Jersey Avenue and 3rd Street, we enter Seton Elementary School. A time-worn, sad face building across the street from my mother's church, Mount Carmel Baptist. This is important. These are the streets. You can look up Seton Elementary if you Google it. It's a school in Washington, D.C. Walker Jones is a school in Washington, D.C. You can walk these streets. Just inside the front door, women out of the advertisements in Ebony are greeting the other parents and children. Ebony, look up that magazine when it was founded, uh, African-American style magazine. The woman who gre greets us has pearls thick as jumbo marbles that come down almost to her navel and she acts as if she had known me all her life. Touching my shoulder, cupping her hand under my chin, she is enveloped in a perfume that I only know is not gardenia. When, in answer to her question, my mother tells her that we live at 1227 New Jersey Avenue, the woman first seems to be picturing in her head where we live. Then she shakes her head and says that we are at the wrong school, that we should be at Walker Jones. 
the little girl notices this woman. She has, you know, the woman has the jumbo pearls uh, out of the, so they're, they're dre the woman's dressed up. This is a, a little flashier place, right? It's across the street from the mother's church, and that's important, though. My mother shakes her head vigorously. I want her to go here, my mother says. If I'd have wanted her someplace else, I'd have took her there. The woman continues to act as if she has known me all my life, but she tells my mother that we live beyond the area that Seton serves. My mother is not convinced, and for several minutes she questions the woman about why I cannot attend Seton. This is why the mother wants her to go to Seton. For as many Sundays as I can remember, perhaps even Sundays when I was in her womb, my mother has pointed across I Street to Seton as we come and go to Mount Carmel. They're church people, right? You're going to go there and learn about the whole world. But one of the guardians of that place is saying no, and no again. I am learning this about my mother. The higher up on the scale of respectability a person is, and teachers are rather high up in her eyes, the less she is liable to let them push her around. This is a fascinating point in the text, where the little girl, I am learning this about my mother. What's also wonderfully fascinating about this short story you know, you can think about all the things we learn in school, reading, writing, math, science, history. Think of all the other subtle things we learn, class, how to interact with people, the things we learn about our parents from watching them interact with people. But finally, I see in her eyes the closing gate, another beautiful metaphor. And she takes my hand and we leave the building. On the steps, she stops as people move past us on either side. So they just live out of the vicinity of Seton, but it's close to their church. Here's a little girl. Mama, I can't go to school. She says nothing at first, then takes my hand again, and we are down the steps quickly and nearing New Jersey Avenue before I can blink. This is my mother, she says. One monkey don't stop, no show. This shows the mother's, the mother's determined. She has determination. She's getting her daughter to school today, no matter what. Here's the other school. Walker Jones is a larger, newer school, and I immediately like it because of that. So it's larger and it's newer. It's a newer school, but it is not across the street from my mother's church, her rock, one of her connections to God, and I sense her doubts as she absently rubs her thumb over the back of her hand. We find our way to the crowded auditorium where gray metal chairs are set up in the middle of the room. Along the wall to the left are tables and other chairs. Every chair seems to occupy by a child or adult. Somewhere in the room, a child is crying, a cry that rises above the buzz talk of so many people. Strewn about the floor are dozens and dozens of pieces of white paper, and people are walking over them without any thought of picking them up. And seeing this lack of concern, I am all of a sudden afraid. What's she afraid of? I don't think the school, the school is, con it's newer. It's a newer school. It's a, it's a nice school. It, it's, it's not uh, financially incomparable to Seton. It's just different. All these people in this area financially are, are kind of, you know, the mother's working class. She works. I think the little girl, she sees this, cha it's chaos, right? Ba kids are screaming and crying. There's paper all over. She's not used to this chaos. She's used to neatness and order. That also tells us the mother has taught her neatness and order that, you know, if you see a piece of paper on the floor, you pick it up. She's neat. Is this where they register for school, my mother asks a woman at one of the tables. The woman looks up slowly as she has heard the question once too often. She nods. She is tiny, almost as small as the girl standing beside her. The woman's hair is set in a mass of curlers, and all those curlers are made of paper money. Here a dollar bill. There a five dollar bill. The girl's hair is arrayed in curls, but some of them are beginning to droop, and this makes me happy. On the table beside the woman's pocketbook is a large notebook worthy of someone in high school, and looking at me, looking at the notebook, the girl places her hand possessively on it. In her other hand, she holds several pencils with thick crowns of additional racers. This is such a, a subtle telling moment here. And I always ask if we were reading this in class. I, I, I love this. This is such a fascinating question. How old are we? I, I'm going to argue it's an elementary school. When we realize other students have, they have nice stuff. You know, like they have like this little girl, she's on in her first day of school and she's wearing nice clothes and nice shoes. But that's it. That's her one nice pair of shoes. And then other people have it's like, you know, it's like the kid has the pair of Air Jordans, but someone else has like five pairs. You notice these things. And I'm curious at what age we are when we notice 
what people have if they have really fancy nice stuff or if people don't have it I think it's pretty young I don't think kids really get nasty about it until maybe middle school but we notice when we're young who has what and who doesn't have what and this is what the little girl's noticing here she the other little girl has a large notebook worthy of someone in high school right she's like damn she has nice stuff right here's the mother though these are the forms you got to use my mother asked a woman picking up a few pieces of the paper from the table is this what you have to fill out the woman tells her yes but that she needs to fill out only one i see my mother says looking about the room then would you help me fill would you help me with this form that is if you don't mind the woman asks my mother what she means this form would you mind helping me fill it out the woman still seems not to understand i can't read it i don't know how to read or write and I'm asking you to help me. My mother looks at me and then looks away. I know almost all of her looks, but this one is brand new to me. Would you help me then? So we find out here the mother can't read or write. And I think this adds another layer to why the first day and why school is so important to the mother. Why, no matter what, she's trying to get her there. The woman says, why sure, and suddenly she appears happier, so much more satisfied with everything. She finishes the form for her daughter. My mother and I step aside to wait for her. We find two chairs nearby and sit. My mother is now diseased, according to the girl's eyes. And until the moment her mother takes her in the form to the front of the auditorium, the girl never stops looking at my mother. I stare back at her. Don't stare, my mother says to me. You know better than that. Such a interesting exchange here. My mother is now diseased according to the girl's eyes. So this, this other little girl looks at, this, at the narrator's mom like something is really wrong with her. And this is a moment of, you know, the mother is ashamed, right? She, she admits she can't read or write. And I'm wondering, I'm going to ask you all this question. Why do you think the mother does this? The mother could have easily grabbed the forms, took them home, and had... Miss Mary Keith and Blondell Harris help her fill them out. She also could have had one of the two women go with her to help her, but she doesn't. Why? Because the mother realizes it's her responsibility. It's her job to get her daughter to school. No one else is going to do it but her, and she's willing to risk shame to make sure her daughter gets the education. And, uh, you know, what's, what's another subtle thing here, as you all can look up if you haven't studied in your history class, I, I think we're in the, in the mid-20th century, the 1950s here. Uh, you can look at the price of the, of the tablets, the Ebony Magazine. Um, there's, there's something with the Great Migration. If you've studied the Great Migration, where African Americans from the South who lived in an agrarian society, farming, they go north to find work. And a lot of these people coming up from the South, like the mom, she probably didn't go to school, right? Because as soon as you're old enough to work, you know, you get to be 10, 11, 12, you work, right? Or even younger, or there wasn't school. So the mother knows how important school is, and she's willing to get her daughter this education no matter what. This is in contrast to Sonny's Blues in some ways. The mother, no matter what, still sees, despite all the problems with society, as education as one of the few forms of social mobility. It's important. Another woman out of the ebony ads takes the woman's child away. Now the woman says upon her turn, let's see what we can do for you. My mother answers the question. The woman reads off the form. They start with my last name and then on to the first and middle names. This is school, I think. This is going to school. My mother slowly enunciates each word of my name. This is my mother. As the questions go on, she takes from her pocketbook document after document as if they will support my right to attend school, as if she has been saving them up for this just this moment. Indeed, she takes out more papers than I have ever seen her do in other places. I love this moment, all these papers here. My birth certificate, baptismal record, a doctor's letter concerning my bout with chicken pox, rent receipts, records of immunization, a letter about our public school assistance payments. You see, that's the that's their, they don't have much money. Even her marriage license. Every single paper that has anything that even remotely to do with my five-year-old life. Few of the papers are needed here, but it does not matter. My mother continues to pull out the documents with the purposefulness of a magician pulling out a long string of scarves. 
another wonderful metaphor by the daughter there as she's older. She has learned that money is the beginning and end of everything in this world. And when the woman finishes, my mother offers her 50 cents and the woman accepts it without hesitation. My mother and I are just about the last parent child in the room. That's another telling moment. 50 cents, if you think back, that's a lot of money for the mother here. And the woman has to take it because if she refuses it, that's another insult to the mother. My mother presents the form to a woman sitting in front of the stage, and the woman looks at it and writes something on a white card, which she gives to my mother. Before long, the woman who has taken the girl with the drooping curls appears from behind us, speaks to the sitting woman, and introduces herself to my mother and me. She's to be my teacher, she tells my mother. My mother stares. We go into the hall while my mother kneels down to her. Her lips are quivering. Why? I'm, I'm curious, you know, do any of you have kids the first day of school? It's a big, it's like, this is the moment where the little girl, she's going away from the mom and she's, she's going to be, she's developing her own identity. She's going to be different now. And there's also going to be probably another wedge or gap from the education that's, that's going to differentiate them. But this is, a, this is their first separation here. I'll be back to pick you up at 12 o'clock. I don't want you to go nowhere. You just wait right here and listen to every word she say. I touch her lips and press them together. It is an old, old game between us. She puts my hand down at my side, which is not part of the game. So the little girl tries to play this game, and the mother puts her hand down. Why? You know, it's one of those things where I think the mother is trying to tell the little girl, you know, you're at school now. You act like a big kid. You act like a grown-up. When you get home later, we can play this game. But now you're in a grown-up world. You have to be serious. She stands and looks a second at the teacher, and then she turns and walks away. I see where she has darned one of her socks the night before. Her shoes make loud sounds in the hall. She passes through the doors, and I can still hear the loud sounds of her shoes. And even when the teacher turns me toward the classrooms, and I hear what must be the singing and talking of all the children in the world, I can still hear my mother's footsteps above it all. Looking back throughout the whole story, at how important education is to the mother. The mother never had education. The mother, like, she wins. She she succeeds. And we can uh, see that from the beautifully illustrative description of the adult daughter looking back at this moment. Just the language, black patent leather miracles, closing gate, like a magician. It's poetry. The daughter speaks in poetry. So what the mother set out to do is get her daughter educated. She succeeded and then some. So in many ways, I read this really short story. It's like a love letter to the mother. It also shows the mother everything, her determination, what she's willing to do. Also the fact that she can't read or write, but she was still willing, willing to sacrifice shame to get her daughter to school on the first day.